Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, session on the Synergy, High Bleeding Risk Patients and DUPT Implementing Latest Clinical Evidence into Real World Practice, sponsored by Boston Scientific. It's my pleasure to chair this session together with Stefan Jains from Sweden. I'm Franz Josef Neumann from uh, Bad Kotzing in Germany. It's, uh, I'd like to introduce my co-chair, and he will tell us about the session objectives. Thank you very much, Franz Josef. Thank you for attending the session. It's a pretty good audience. Uh, we're delighted to speak about this very interesting area. How do we balance between ischemic risk and bleeding risk? And how do we evaluate patients at bleeding risk? How do we select stents? How do we select uh, long-term uh, dual antiplatelet therapy? Uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest. The session is sponsored by uh, Boston Scientific, and I have received institutional research grants from the manufacturer. So it's really about balancing. This is a picture from me on a slack line. It's really difficult to, you can f fall on either side, right or left. Uh, right side here would uh, represent risk for ischemic events, um, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, uh, stroke. The other side is bleeding risk, of course, uh, paraprocedural bleeding risks, puncture site bleedings, but most feared are, of course, uh, cerebral bleedings. And how do we balance? How do we stent? How do we treat patients? How do we select the best way? to uh, avoid both of these um, important complications. An important question is always, w which is the worst, to have an ischemic complication or a bleeding complication? What would you prefer as a patient, a bleeding event or an ischemic event? Of course, it depends on what type of event you're, you're talking about. In this study, we did a subgroup analysis from the PLATO trial, tried to, to evaluate and compare bleeding risk versus ischemic risk. And here we looked at what is the impact on mor mortality uh, depending on the different bleeding uh, definitions on the left-hand side. So what is the relative effect on mortality of an MI or stroke event versus a bleeding event? So when we looked at Plato definition, Timmy definition, and Gusto definition, it was only with the Gusto definition, which, is, which identifies very severe bleeding events, that bleeding events were worse than an ischemic event on the impact on mortality. So it, it appears that we also looked at the short term and long term. And it appears that, uh, that long term is primarily very large bleeding events that really impact on mortality uh, versus uh, MI stroke events. And paraprocedural <coughs> bleeding events do not impact on future uh, survival as much as spontaneous bleeding events and spontaneous myocardial infarction <coughs> events. So the session objectives, what we'll discuss here is the evidence for DAPT duration in the context of coronary interventions, patients receiving stents. Uh, we'll discuss the potential benefits of bioabsorbable polymer DS in high bleeding risk patients, review the synergy design and completed an ongoing DAPT studies, uh, studies that have randomized and observed patients receiving uh, DAPT uh, with a synergy as uh, the background. And finally, to understand how to relate trial data into real world practice, because what we want to is that the randomized trials should inform us how to treat patients in, an, on an, our, in our everyday clinical practices. So without further ado, uh, we'll go on and I'll invite Jose uh, the Torres Hernandez uh, to give his uh, presentation. I'll open the slide for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good morning, thank you. Good invitation to be here. I'm going to, uh, to present the review of the, the guidelines. These are my conflicts. This uh, issue has been very uh, become very complex. Uh, 20 years ago, it was just so simple. One month for bare metals. 10 years ago, 12 months for VES. No problem. But now you have so many choices, uh, as you wish. Really, you have really an individualized therapy. Many, many trials have been conducted in the last 10 years, and that's why it's very important to take all the evidence 
and to develop documents like this. This is a focus update published in, in the last summer by the European Society of Cardiology, and Marco Bargimigli coordinated this group to put all this evidence and finally derive some recommendations. There has been change in recommendations before with respect to, to the new ones. I'm going to remark only some of them related with the topic today. For example, uh, dual therapy is considered instead of triple therapy in patients with oral anticoagulation and DAPT when bleeding risk is higher. We have new recommendations, which is very important. For example, that for the first time in ACS patients, six months could be considered in a high bleeding risk, in this case indicated by the precise DAP score over 25. We have the introduction of the scores. This is not really a strong recommendation. There are some reservations, but for the first time, we have two scores that are recommended to be applied in these patients to guide the time of the APT. We have these scores in the websites. You can use them. You can apply to your patients. When? This is very nicely shown by Gargiulo in a paper in your intervention. You can apply the precise DAP score at the index procedure, and if you have a value over 25 indicating a high bleeding risk, you can decide by a short DAPT period of three, six months, depending on ACS, a stable. But if it's less than 25, you can go to a standard, maybe 12 months. And then, in an eventful patients, when they get the 12 months uh, follow-up, you can apply the DAP score. And then if it's over two or two, you can keep going with the APT. And in those patients with less than two, you stop the APT and put the patient only in one antiplatelet agent. This is the summary of the, of the recommendations. You see here is based on the consideration of the stable or ACS. No longer distinction in between DES and BMS, no longer. Only for virus all over the scaffolds. And these are the times for the different uh, settings. I'm going to show you in detail. For example, a stable coronary artery disease. In general, six months is recommended regardless of this, irrespective of the stem type. This time is going down to three months when the patient is at high bleeding risks. For example, using the score, precise DAP, over 25. But you can also even go down to one month in very uh, high risk patients when even three is considered to be uh, risky for the patient to one month. This is linked to some publications, but this is really a recommendation class two that we have now. This is for patients in acute coronary syndrome. This is a classic 12 months general recommendation for these patients, like in the past. But now you can go to six months in cases with high bleeding risks, again, <coughs> indicated, for example, using the precise DAP score over 25. This is uh, in ACS again, which is a prolongation of the therapy. When the patients have tolerated uh, the DAPT for the time, 12 months, you can put the patient for longer in the APT. To be for both, and specifically for ticagrelor based on the Pegasus trail, and you can treat the patient with ticagrelor 60 BID longer than 12 months. But these are two big recommendations. What about the more even complex patient that is on oral anticoagulation and needs really some antiplatelet therapy because it's treated with stents. Here, uh, again, for the first time, you have to balance, uh, as Dr. James showed before, the ischemic and the bleeding risks. If the prevailing risk is ischemic, then you need triple therapy for one month or up to six months, depending. But if the prevailing risk is bleeding, you can get rid of triple therapy, no longer triple therapy, out. And you go in to treat the patient only with dual, oral anticoagulation plus copidogrel. This is new, the possibility of uh, the recommendation of dual. But we have new evidences. These were presented after the release of the guidelines. There are three trials comparing in acute coronary syndrome short and long DAPT periods. Three versus 12, specific extent, CD, CD34 coating. In this case, uh, this uh, 1,500 patients were randomized. The primary endpoint was equivalent for both three and 12 months, but, and this is important, you see a strong trend for more ischemic events, numerically more events, in the group with uh, shorter, with three months. I repeat, this is related with a specific stem design. The second trial comparing short and long in acute coronary syndrome is six versus 12 in the DAP STEMI. These are patients with ST elevation MI. Smaller trial, 870, and again, we saw no differences in the primary outcome, which was even lower in the short, in the six months. And in this case, no difference in individual in points between six and 12 months. And the third of the trials in ACS comparing short and long is this, six versus 12. 
like the previous one. This was presented in ACC, it's larger trial, 2,700 patients, and again, no differences. But, as usually we see in these trials, with shorter, you have more infarction, with longer, you have more bleeding, and you always have to uh, this trade off. With the longer, you decrease infarction, with the shorter, you decrease the bleeding, then the important thing is to provide the patient the best the duration based on the consideration of the both, the ischemic and the bleeding. Senior trial is going to be discussed later on, then I'm not going to be in detail. I'm only going to show you this nice meta-analysis, showing a very interesting thing. If you are a young guy, you benefit from the longer therapy, but you are not that much elderly, because I don't think 65 is now elderly, really. It's, uh, it's more. <laughs> But, but they did the analysis for 65 because they had more patients. But anyway, if you are over 65, you get more benefit from the shore compared to the long, which is really important. Age ma matters in this point. And finally, the last evidence uh, is all the last trial that was presented after the guidelines is the redual PCI. In this trial, two arms of the Bigatron plus uh, P2Y12 were compared with the classic triple therapy with Coumadin. And in this case, uh, we, we have less bleeding, of course, with the dual therapy compared to the triple, special for the low dose of the bigotron, and the same incidence of thrombembolic and ischemic events. This study with Pioneer and is, uh, in, my way, in my view, uh, really uh, stressing the importance of um, the dual therapy in these patients, and maybe not uh, the need, uh, not staying in the need for triple. And these are the conclusions. The ESC guidelines settled the tailored indication for type and duration of the APT based on the individual consideration of ischemic and bleeding risks. And with regard to the bleeding risks, we have now scores. These are recommended with some reservation. It's a too big class. But we have these scores. We will have more in the future. And it's uh, very helpful for this tailored therapy. New evidence is coming, and it's going to come in the upcoming years. And all the evidence is in, in the direction of reducing the APT duration in high bleeding risk population, a population that is growing because we have more and more old people with comorbidities, with anemia, renal failure, with prior stroke, with prior bleeding, etc. The evidence for different and varying APT durations could be related, and it's going to be related always with the patient profiling, but also with the stent technology characteristics. That's the reason why we have uh, all the, the devices and stents like Synergy tested with different DPT durations in this uh, high bleeding risk population. I think it's the time for precision medicine, but also time for precision medicine applied to this topic with this antithrombotic therapy after PCI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. We do have a few minutes now for discussion and questions. And, and this uh, first presentation is, uh, is more is more oriented to, towards f uh, pharmacology, whereas the other presentation was more, st more slightly more standard oriented. So I'd like to take the opportunity to discuss uh, risk assessment, how to identify patients at high risk, and to, by starting with a, a vote here by raise of hands, who of you is regularly using a risk score for evaluation of bleeding risk post PCI in stable or ACS patients? Who uses who have you used uh, risk scores for that evaluation as recommended by Jose and the guidelines? Very few. <laughs> so that, that was what, yeah. I, what, I, what I thought. But the guidelines here are pretty strong on saying that you should use a score, and you presented the, the, the precise DAP score. Yeah. What do you think? But it's a, I expected this. <laughs> yeah. Not many people really uh, still using them. I think we still rely on our clinical sense. And we appreciate the, the risk of bleeding in an subjective way. You, know, you see an 85 years old lady with uh, anemia, and you know it's a high bleeding risk. But the use of a scores, we have been always very, a bit reluctant. I still remember the scores for the risk of ACS patients, and they were not applied systematically in the hospitals. But they need that, uh, I think, personally, that the precise DAP score is uh, not mandatory to be followed, but is useful. I think we should start to apply these scores to learn from them, from the, um, the positive aspects of their scores and the negative, because the score is not able to capture all the diverse reality of our patients. But I think we should start to collect these scores, to include it in the, in the reports on the electronic health records, and to learn from them. 
how, how do you how do you um, recommend to use that? Because we're interventional cardiologists, we perform the procedures. We typically don't see our these, these patients. Maybe not when they're discharged. We don't see them at six months follow up and and twelve months follow up. Always, some do, but most of the time. I don't see my patients particularly at a 12 months follow up. So yeah. how do we how do we make this work in reality? We usually uh, for long provide a recommendation of time. When we do the report of the procedure to the clinician, we indicate the type of the APT, clopidogrel prasugrel and the time. But this is a recommendation. Finally the clinician has the last uh, word in this. Uh, we are not going to follow the patient, but one of the important new recommendations of the guidelines is the dyna dynamic nature of this recommendation. Because you, don't, you do not know if the patient is going to bleed in three months or is going to have a new angina. Then it's a recommendation for this time. But the important now is that uh, we have new, new stents that are safe with shorter uh, DAPT period. This means that, for example, if you have an ACS patient, as I say, 12 months, if this patient is having bleedings, or even minor bleeding sac, six months, I can't stop. You could stop. This means that it's a dynamic thing. You are, the recommendation is at the beginning of the, when you discharge the patient, you planned six months, 12 months, but it's gonna be dynamic. Maybe you can discontinue it before, if the patient is having some troubles with the therapy, and even to stand. I say 12 months, but I call sometimes a patient for a trial, you know, follow up. No, I have 24, 24 months taking the clopidogrel. My uh, doctor said to said, tell me to continue. Well, this is, is dynamic because the, the ischemic risk was high. The patient have no bleeding in the first year. Then it's, it's, it's ongoing. It's, the therapy is, is, is keeping there. Then uh, what we do is initial recommendation, but is the follow-up of the patient by the clinician who's going to be finally uh, to decide to stop to continue. It depends. I, I agree, and I think the virtue uh, uh, of the precise step score is that it was designed to use uh, after the initial procedure, yep. whereas the step score was used at 12 months. At 12 months. And, and if you are, want to use the precise step score, I think you should use, you do exactly what you recommend, to write a note that the precise step score is this and this after the procedure, and urge for the non-interventional colleagues to look at this and take this into consideration, yep. reevaluate the patients at six months or 12 months yep. uh, to take uh, action decisions on the, the, on the duration of, of the, uh, the DAPT. Right. And one, one importance of the precise DAPT score is, is because many of the risk factors we're discussing are affecting both the risk of bleeding as well as ischemic events. H, for example, uh, it's a very strong predictor of bleeding events, but it's also a strong predictor of, of ischemic events. Uh, but the precise step score includes two important uh, um, factors, that is prior bleeding and hemoglobin, yeah. that do not really affect ischemic events. Ischemic. So right. that's, I think, the most important yeah. factors of the precise step. Yeah. It's a positive aspect of the precise step. For the first time, we have a specific score for the APT focus in bleeding. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk, good discussion. <coughs> now it's my pleasure to introduce Olivier Verin. He will talk about the senior trial, decision making in an aging population. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about the senior trial. These are my conflict of interest. I think we'll all agree that the elderly patient uh, represent a very prevalent population nowadays uh, in our cat lab. Uh, they have complex disease, they have severe disease and diffuse disease. In 2016, in the National Registry of US and CDR, up to 25% of the PCI were performed in patients 75 and above. However, they've been poorly represented in prior studies on DES and DAPT, and when they were in the trial, they were often very highly selected, and therefore there is no clear recommendation for PCI and DPAT strategy in this specific population. In addition, uh, because of uh, the, the fear of bleeding, they are often treated with BMS and a short DAPT as a strategy to limit bleeding complication. The senior trial was a single uh, blind randomized clinical trial dedicated to elderly population 1,200 patients, 75 and above, have been randomized to thin-strut biodegradable polymer uh, DES uh, 
the synergy, or a thin strut BMS, which was very com comparable, the, the Rebel stand. Please note that the DAPT duration was not randomized in the senior trial, <laughs> but instead it was selected by the investigators prior to stent randomization as to be tailored to clinical presentation. And it should be one month in stable patient and six months in patient with unstable presentation. The primary event of the trial was a MACE at one year, all-cause mortality, MI, stroke, and ischemia-driven target lesion of vascularization. The group of patients was uh, well-balanced. Uh, uh, mean age was 81. They had uh, several risk factors. Please note that atrial fibrillation was present in 17% of the patient, and anemia was present in almost 15% of the patient. Those two factors are associated with an high risk of bleeding. Clinical presentation, uh, roughly 55% of patients with stable presentation at baseline and 45% of the patient with unstable presentation, 35% uh, of the patient had either ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI, but some degree of myocardial injury, and it was absolutely similar between the both groups. And geographically, uh, this was an European trial, so 80% of the uh, procedure were performed through a transradial approach. Uh, a third of the patient had the multivessel disease, uh, 32 millimeter as a mean length, stent, less, stent length, uh, similar in both groups. Importantly, because DAPT was not randomized, it was important to check that DAPT duration was similar in both groups. And as you can see here, the two curves are almost absolutely superimpossible, which means that the duration of DAPT was really similar between the patient receiving DS and BMS. You can uh, note two steps in these curves. The, the first one at one month, where stable patients stopped to clopidogrel, and the second one at six months, when uh, patient, uh, unstable patients stop uh, thionoperidine. Please note that despite the recommendation, about 20% of the patient keep going on DAPT uh, until one year. This is a primary uh, endpoint that has been presented and published earlier. Uh, uh, DES, 1.6% of MACE versus 16.4% for BMS. This is a 29% reduction. The p-value is uh, 0.016. Please note that the two curves are still diverging at uh, one year, and we are actually working on the two years uh, follow-up analysis. MACE component, the, the vast majority of the benefit is related to a, a reduction in IDTLR favoring DES, 1.7% versus 5.9%. There is no difference whatsoever in mortality, stroke, and MI between both groups. What about security, safety? Well, BARC 2 to 5, 3 to 5 were similar in both groups and not that high. BARC 3 5 were 3.5 versus 3.6. Please note that the stent thrombosis rate, despite this uh, BMS like regimen in DS, was extremely low, 0.5% in the Synstrat uh, BPDS versus 1.4. The difference was not significant. I'm going to show you now some uh, data that have been presented earlier at uh, EuroPCR. Uh, the one month and six months DAPT groups. The patient uh, uh, receiving a selected one month DAPT were 57%, while patient uh, selected to receive six months were 43%. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of patients selected to receive one month were in stable condition at baseline. This is almost 90%, while patients selected to receive six months were in unstable presentation at baseline. And this is the ischemic event in the group of patients uh, receiving one month DAPT in the senior trial at one year. MACE, again, is a significantly decreased in a DES compared to a BMS, 10.5 versus 15.9. This is a 34% reduction, and the p-value is significant. And this is driven by a, a dramatic reduction, almost 90% reduction in IDTLR, 0.6% versus 6.5% in the BMS. The p-value is also highly significant. What about uh, safety? Uh, sorry, what about the component of the, uh, the MACE? You see that, again, there is no difference in mortality, no difference in stroke, no difference in MI. The vast majority of the benefit is observed in the uh, reduction in IDTLR. What about safety? Well, the stent thrombosis in this group of patients receiving only one month DAPT after DS implantation is 0.3% versus 1.4. The difference is not significant, but very low rate of stent thrombosis and very low rate of bleeding. This is about 2 to 5, 3.7 versus 5.1%.
I think in conclusion, uh, the latest generation of thin strut biodegradable polymer uh, DES, namely the Synergy stent versus BMS in elderly patient treated with short, I should call this BMS-like DAPT, can reduce MACE, mainly by reducing uh, ischemia-driven target lesion vascularization. The duration of DAPT and bleeding were absolutely similar in the two groups during the entire trial. Stent thrombosis was extremely low and was not significantly different between DES and BMS. And specifically for the patient treated with one month DAPT, the vast majority of them being stable patient at baseline, for efficacy, we observed a 90% reduction in IDTLR, 0.6 versus 6.5%, without any difference in mortality, stroke, and MI. And what about safety? Extremely low rate of stent thrombosis, 0.3% versus 1.4%, and the p-value wa was not significant. I think it's fair to say that PCI with a contemporary thin strut DES is more effective and as safe as BMS in the elderly population with CAD on short DAPT, Again, tailored on their clinical presentation, one month in stable patient and six months in ACS patient, I think that BMS should no longer be used as a strategy to reduce uh, uh, bleeding uh, in elderly population. With that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really very interesting uh, study and uh, also the, the one month data, they are really intriguing. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. It's amazing the very low rate of stent thrombosis with the DES group, but how can you explain the 1.4 uh, stent thrombosis in the bare metal stent group using the regular DAPT regimen? Uh, there is nothing that I can explain. I can I can just see. I mean, it was 1.4, and I don't have any explanation for that. Uh, the the rate of stent thrombosis in the DS group is 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 extremely low. It's it's maybe lower than uh, we would have expected. Uh, if uh, if if you want to comment and compare to other stents that have compared short DAPT in this type of population, for example uh, DCS, I think one of the major difference between both stent uh, is the, the the stent sickness, the threat sickness. I mean the the stent that we use in the trial were uh, thin strut. I mean seven, 74 microns for the synergy and 80 microns for the rebel stent BMS while in the leaders free, the two stents that were used, both the DCS and the BMS, were in the range of 120 microns. So I think this can, this can make a difference because we know that uh, stent thickness is uh, related to shear stress, platelet deposition, and, and finally to stent thrombosis. But this is not a direct comparison. Th there is a, a lot of uh, similarities between the two studies, but this is not the same population, so I cannot really give you a, a comment on the direct comparison with those stents. This is what uh, we have observed. But I, I need to add that it, it's a common theme that um, the stand, bare metal stents have a higher stent thrombosis rate than uh, drug eluting stents. And this is also shown by meta analysis comparing um, bare metal stents with um, new generation drug eluting stents. Correct. And it was seen as early as in the pivotal trials with the, with the Cypher stent. Uh, where, where there was an, an, an increase in the early days, in, in the first months, in, in event rate in the bare metal group, and then there was a catching up and the curves crossed. So, so, so it's, not, uh, it's not surprising. But maybe the 1.4 was a little bit uh, higher than expected, but M as you said, in the Norsten trial, the stent thrombosis rate the same, in the DS same, same, is lower than pattern, in the BMS. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. May, may I ask you, to what extent does it pertain only to elderly patients? Is it... I mean, you can't answer this because you only included elderly patients, but um, don't you think that um, we would find the same uh, results, more or less, if, if we had included a broader spectrum of patients? I, I, I don't think so. I, I think the, the very specific uh, particularity of uh, the elderly patient, as has been mentioned by uh, Professor James, uh, this is a, a population where the, the thrombotic risk is very high and the bleeding risk is very high. While, while in younger patients, in, in a lot of the patients, the bleeding risk is not that high. So how much are you going to pay to prevent uh, some thrombotic event? Uh, 
how much are you going to play in, in bleeding? And, and uh, uh, my, my colleague just presented you the data from the meta-analysis by the Greg Stone Group, showing that, well, elderly, I agree, it was uh, more than 65, but there is clearly a difference between patients uh, younger than 65 and older than 65. Younger than 65, they do benefit from a longer period of DAPT, while elderly patients, uh, more than 65, they don't benefit for a longer period of, of DAPT. So I think there is specifically uh, something in the elderly that makes short duration of DAPT attractive. Uh, but I would also like to precise that I don't think all the elderly patients should receive a short duration of DAPT, but I'm now sure that all the, the, the elderly should not receive a long period of DAPT. But now we need to pick up those patients that may potentially benefit for a long period of DAPT. While it was the opposite uh, a year ago, we wanted to select those patients who can benefit from a short period of DAPT. I would say that for elderly, short DAPT is going to be the default strategy, and, and we need to select those patients who can benefit from prolonged DAPT duration, but that's going to be more than six months, that's going to be more than nine months, and probably more than 12 months also. I think it's very important to point out, and you did that, in fact, very well, that the senior trial was not a DAPT trial, so it doesn't inform us whether or not to, sh to select a long versus short duration of DAPT, but it does inform us very well that if you believe that a short DAPT, period of DAPT, is preferable, we have now very strong evidence to select the synergy stent uh, to be able uh, to receive better results than a, the, an, a, a good comparator because I think that is the strength of the senior trial, that it has a very strong competitor in the competitor arm. It's a good be, uh, bare metal stand. Despite that fact, the, st the synergy stand performs better in this population. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Now I call Giulio Stefanini to the podium. Uh, Giulio will speak about the POEM registry, uh, one month DAPT in high bleeding risk patients. Uh, please, Julio. So, uh, good afternoon, actually, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, I will uh, provide you an overview of this ongoing study. These are my conflicts of interest. So we were talking about uh, uh, shortening DAPT in uh, patients at certain level of risk, and this, of course, is a matter in patients at high bleeding risk. The question is how frequently do we encounter these patients in regular clinical practice? There is a, a, a long discussion about this. And it's interesting, this uh, analysis from the Burn PCI registry, it comes from Stefan Winderker and Marco Valgimili, what they did was to uh, inquire a uh, true real world old comer registry that, uh, uh, in which all patients during the last 10 years were included. And uh, applying the leaders free inclusion criteria to this registry, it came out that almost 40% of patients treated in everyday clinical practice uh, actually fit the uh, HBR criteria applied by the leaders free. So it's, it's a meaningful population. Actually, based on available evidence, current guidelines recommend to consider short DAPT after DES implantation in these patients, so high bleeding risk patients. However, whether contemporary polymer based drug looting stents have a similar safety and efficacy profile as polymer-free devices, it's currently unknown. So the aim of the POEM study is to evaluate the safety of biosorbable polymer-coated Everolimus looting synergy stent followed by one month DAPT in HVR patients. It's actually a real-world study, a single arm. Uh, patients are included after PCI with synergy and a one month DAPT is applied, actually, uh, uh, the DAPT is based on aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. After one month, single antiplatelet therapy with aspirin alone is recommended. In case of oral anticoagulation, patients receive oral anticoagulation in, an, in addition to a P2Y12 inhibitor for the first month, and after that they continue uh, with the oral anticoagulation without a P2Y12 inhibitor. I told you the Synergy device is used. The study will include 1,023 patients. And actually, it's powered for a primary endpoint of uh, uh, safety, meaning a composite of cardiac death, MI, and definite or probable centrombosis at one year. The population is broad. It includes stable patients as well as patients with acute coronary syndrome, ranging from non-ST as well as ST elevation ACS. The inclusion criteria are 
uh, the following, meaning the presence of a stenosis above 50% that requires treatment with PCI on top of at least one HBR criteria, which are actually the same HBR criteria that were used in the leaders free trial. Uh, just to provide you some details on sample size consideration, the study is powered for non-inferiority against objective performance criteria based on evidence coming from the leaders free trial. So we uh, actually confront ourselves with an OPC event rate for the primary endpoint of 9.4% at one year. This is a summary of the study flow. 1,023 patients treated with Synergy, as I told you, one month, the APT. You see here the stratification according to the use or not of oral anticoagulation, primary endpoint at one year. I will provide you now some uh, details on uh, preliminary uh, data coming <coughs> from the uh, one month follow-up of the first 160 patients included. Here you have a summary of the study organization. Actually, it's an Italian effort. We have a number of Italian centers that are recruiting at this point in time. And uh, the, uh, there is an independent CRO that helps us with data management and monitoring. And in there, there is an independent clinical event committee chaired by Davide Capodanno, who uh, is assigning in, uh, events. I told you 164 patients that have completed 30 days follow-up. So this is a preliminary analysis. The outcomes that I will present are 30 days outcomes, while the study is powered for one year clinical follow-up. Here you see an overview of reasons for inclusion. I think that it's quite interesting to see the distribution of reasons for inclusion. It's also very interesting to compare these with the leaders free inclusion criteria. I told you we are applying the same inclusion criteria as for leaders free, and you see that actually the uh, HBR criteria that we are uh, considering in our patient population are very similar to the ones uh, used in leaders free. There is a striking difference in age, meaning that we tend to have uh, age above 75 less frequently to be the reason to include patients in our registry. The reason is that we are focusing on HBR patients, not on elderly. So these are probably different patient populations. <coughs> Here you see baseline clinical characteristics in the POEM study as compared to leaders free, quite similar in terms of age, in terms of prevalence of uh, female diabetic patients and so on. Also the CRUCID score is quite comparable between the two studies. Indication for PCI, again, we have around 3% of patients that <coughs> had ST elevation MI at baseline, another 25% non-ST elevation, and 70% uh, have a stable coronary artery disease. Here you see an overview of symptoms, angina, as well as uh, NIA at baseline and 30 days follow-up. There is an improvement of symptoms. It goes without saying, but it's to provide you uh, the level of granularity that the uh, uh, registry will provide us in terms of uh, outcomes description. Medical therapy, I also think that this is interesting at this chart in 30 days. Of course, you realize that uh, the 30 days follow-up it includes patients that are still taking clopidogrel up to the 30th day. Therefore, we still see that there is 17% of patients that took clopidogrel at the time of the 30 days follow-up visit. So again, this is interesting to provide you an overview of the uh, degree of details that we are having about this population. However, it still doesn't inform us too much about the outcomes. And target vessels, uh, you see in the fairly equal distribution between the circumflex, the LAD, the RCA, and a 4% left main treatment. And here instead you see the angiographic characteristics. It's a relatively complex population. Around one third of patients had bifurcation lesions. And you see that 32% uh, have type C lesion, another 30% type B2 lesion. So it's a relatively complex population. Actually, the stent per patient ratio very compares very favorably with uh, real-world all-comma randomized trials. Cl clinical outcomes at 30 days. Of course, we are talking about 164 patients with 30-day outcomes, so not many events up to now. We had uh, one patient that was re-hospitalized due to a traumatic injury 24 days after PCI, and actually this injury led to death due to severe bleeding 40 days, 45 days after PCI. One patient was re-hospitalized due to a cardiac condition, and we have 17 patients with post-procedural post troponin release five times above the upper limit of normal. Of course, this does not suffice to qualify these events as periprocedural MI, since the independent adjudication will be based on the definition of the third universal definition of myocardial infarction.
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, to conclude, HBR patients are a relevant group of patients undergoing PCI in everyday clinical practice. Current guidelines recommend short DAPT in HBR patients. Optimal DAPT duration might be device-specific, and certainly the POEM study will provide evidence supporting the use of synergy or almosoluting scent followed by one month DAPT in patients at high bleeding risk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julio. Are there questions from the audience, discussion points? We're happy to take those directly. So it's Julio, a very uh, important study that you're doing. What, what's the role of these uh, bleeding risk scores? Do, do you assess a precise DAP, a precise, uh, DAP score this, or, or yeah. DAP score, something like that? Uh, we do assess this prospectively. However, this is not an inclusion criteria for the study, and it does not condition the strategy applied in the study. So this will be an information that is included in the study. However, we are not basing the inclusion, and we are not basing the one-month strategy on the precise DAPT score, but mainly because the study was uh, designed prior to the introduction of precise DAPT. Okay. Do, do, do you think... If you had to design the study now, you would include it? Or, or do you think well, it's, it's better to have more easy criteria? So I tell you, I think that it's... So let's put it this way. Uh, I think that the precise DAPT is a very useful score in everyday clinical practice. On the other side, I want data that are comparable with the available evidence. And at this point in time, we need to acknowledge the fact that there is one randomized control trial that has specifically investigated this patients at high bleeding risk, which is the LEADER3 trial. And therefore, I want evidence that is comparable to that trial in order to have some uh, inferential kind of conclusion. Of course, ignoring important scores that such as the precise DAP would be a mistake also since it's it is a score that is recommended by the current ESC guidelines. However, the study design did not include the score, and I think that if I would redesign the study today, I probably would not base inclusion on the precise DAPT. Varen? It's, it's so it's a single arm perspective uh, study. It's, uh, it doesn't have a direct comparison with another device. It's powered for non-inferiority against objective performance criteria derived by the available evidence. Do you have an option for superiority? Uh, for, we could argue this. So, yes, you could argue whether it's uh, ethical or not to uh, test superiority against objective performance criteria. However, uh, we are not doing so and we will not be powered to evaluate superiority. And I would also say that it's a slippery um, kind of claim to claim superiority against objective performance criteria coming from previous literature. So meaning what I'm saying is that you could, uh, you can claim to do as good. If you do better, I think that to prove that you will need a direct comparison in the setting of a randomized trial. Thank you very much, Julio. Excellent talk. Now we turn to uh, clinical practice, and uh, I call um, Dr. Andres Inuges Romo to the podium, and he will talk on translating the evidence into daily clinical practice, real-world case examples. Mrs. Chairman, co-chair, ladies and gentlemen, let me, uh, yeah. I would like to thank the invitation to participate in this interesting meeting, first of all. And I will try to show you two cases that illustrate most of the dilemmas that we are dealing with in the, in the real practice in this complex type of patients. The first case is a female, 84 years old, with high blood pressure, obesity, and uh, peripheral vascular disease that suffered an ischemic transient uh, accident in 2087. It's a, a mistake. Uh, patient also had uh, prior disease as thalassemia, anemia, and ischemic colonic disease ulcer in 2017. 
The patient uh, was admitted because typical chest pain since the last three days and the last episode of uh, 45 minutes at rest and admitted because of the diagnosis of an acute coronary syndrome without ST elevations with a normal left ventricular function and uh, evolved with a rise in the myocardial uh, marker of damage with a peak of uh, troponin of 3.5 nanograms. I uh, use this uh, classical uh, score risk in order to illustrate uh, how it's complex uh, to take decision in this type, type of patient. If we use the Hasbleed the score and the chat bus score, we might point out that the patient has a Hasbleed score of five points. That means 9.1 bleeding risk, or in other words, 12 patients might experience a major event per year per 100 patients treated. And in the chest bus score, that was seven, the patient have a nearly 11% of a stroke risk. So that means 15 patients 15 patient may uh, experience a major combined uh, ischemic event per year and per 100 patients uh, treated. A patient have a two lesion, one in the osteo of the LID, and another in the mid segment of the LID with normal circumflex and right coronary artery. Uh, with a minimal lumen in the osteal of LAD of 3.3 millimeter by the OCT analysis. And the lesion was treated, both lesion, first of all, the lesion in the LAD in the mid segment, and by a compliant predilatation without using a compliant balloon, and implantation on a, on a stent at the synergy of 2.5 to 24 millimeters implanted at 16 atmosphere with good uh, result that you can see in the OCT image, in the, in the angio image. Later, the patient was treated uh, the, in the lesion of the origin of the LID by another uh, drug eluting synergy stent of 3.5 32 millimeters at 14 atmosphere initially and with an over dilation of, on, with using the same balloon until 22 atmosphere with good result and with uh, overlapping with the distal uh, stent that uh, was previously implanted increasing the area to 2.2 millimeters square. The second uh, case is a female, 80 years old, diabetics, high blood pressure, with uh, allergy of the aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, that uh, was uh, evaluated by typical chest pain at rest by night, was more than 20 minutes of duration, with ST elevation in the anterior leads. The patient was transferred by the, the emergency services to the cath lab because of the diagnosis of an acute MI. Uh, the patient received 180 milligram of ticagrelor previously to uh, be admitted in the hospital and 5,000 units of heparin. But when the patient arrived to the cath lab, the chest pain disappeared and the ST was normalized. So the decision of the operator was to delay the, the next day the procedure and, in, and try to do a prior protocol or desensitization for aspirin the troponin was, was normal. This patient was a low, low risk than the previous one with a score of three on the HAS bleed, that means 5.8 bleeding risk, and a score of five in the chest back, that means 7.7% 7 .7 of the stroke uh, risk. The patient uh, in the coronary angiogram saw that uh, a severe narrowing in the origin in the proximal segment of the LAD, as you can see in the image, with normal cor right coronary and left circumflex uh, artery. The patient was treated by a synergy stent of four millimeters, 12 of length, um, implanted at 16 atmosphere with uh, uh, over dilation at 20 atmosphere and with a good uh, and final uh, result, uh, with a good position, not uh, entering the stent in the left main and uh, precisely implanted in the osteum of the LID, solving the, the result and improving the lumen of the LID, as you may see in the right panel of the slides. I think uh, this case illustrates uh, both uh, the main problem that this type of patient uh, present in the clinical setting. The first case, an acute syndrome in a patient with high bleeding risk and high ischemic risk. Uh, 
and it's, it's, it's important to take a decision on how long dual antiplatelet -like therapy may be in diagnosis and may be using in the patient, and what type of antiplatelet -like therapy is the more, the more useful. And the second case, in my opinion, is a complex patient because it's diabetic with high bleeding risk mainly, but also with high ischemic risk, and illustrate the same uh, problem of the, of the previous one patient, uh, with addition another uh, new issue that is the diabetic condition of the patient, uh, but in both maybe we can argue the, the, what are the advantages of the use of the synergy stents. Both patients evolved uh, well in the hospital in the, during the hospitalization and was discharged alive and without complications with the proper anti double antiplatelet therapy. It's uh, one, the first one with clopidogrel and the second one with ticagrelor. And uh, at the end of the first month was both asymptomatic. And this is all that I might show you and might promote the discussion about the uh, three main important issues. What is the role of the synergy stent in this type of complex patients? Secondly, uh, how important is to choose the proper anti platelet regime and how long? Um, first, uh, if the, the balance of the high ischemic risk uh, or bleeding risk might modify our attitude in this type of complex patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for an interesting case, case presentation and case discussion. Um, I just want to say that I, I was a little bit surprised to see that you evaluated score risk both for bleeding and ischemic events with two scores that were derived and validated for atrial fibrillation yeah. and uh, for Hasblad atrial fibrillation and warfarin therapy. Um, I would strongly recommend for assessment of ischemic risk and bleeding risk use scores that have been derived and validated for ischemia and acute coronary syndromes rather than atrial fibrillation. And for bleeding assessment, Hasblad was fairly poorly actually derived in the original pu publication and has not been validated either for, neither for atrial fibrillation nor uh, acute coronary syndromes. So I would, I would propose to rather use a score for, for ischemia and bleeding, such as a precise step score rather than these scores. Yeah, what, you're, what you? you're right, but I choose this type of classical risk score not uh, only because of uh, uh, illustrating the difficulty of uh, the decision in patients that uh, you might point out that uh, number, concrete number of risk score, maybe mm -hmm. bleeding or maybe ischemic. But this is the question, the, the risk, the, the, the combined risk of this type of patient and the difficulty to take decision in this uh, type of patient. But you are right. Well, the, the, the beauty of the precise step score in this setting would be that um, in the first patient, it automatically goes above 25 because uh, there was a previous bleed, and, and then you are always on, on the yeah. side of high bleeding risk because this is the, in, in, in this data set, it was the strongest predictor of, of a subsequent bleed. So, so this would be an easy, uh, easy, easy going decision. Yeah. Please hear. Uh, it's a comment re related with the use of a squirts and uh, Stefan James' comment. Uh, the APT, uh, the longer is the APT, we prevent more in mice. And the longer is the APT, the proportion of the mice that we prevent are less related with thrombosis, are ne the novel lesions in mice. And the best prognostic score for a mice after vascularization is a synthesis score. I think I, I am really uh, willing to see a, a very integrative uh, study combining different scores, but specifically because we are talking about precise that, but we don't have a ischemic score. We have Grace's score, which is different. We have chas Bart, which is different. But uh, the use of Sintas score in, uh, in these patients could be a nice indicator of how long could be the APT for preventing a mice. I mean, that Sintas score uh, is there, was developed by a Boston uh, scientific study, which is a landmark study, and is the best prognostic score for a mice after vascularization. Then uh, it could be a a good score to balance against the precise DAP to decide uh, if to go further in the APT or shorter. It's, a, it's just a comment. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I, so, so I, this is very interesting and very complex, of course, to discuss how to assess risk. And, and the Syntax score, which is a great score, was derived to assess the risk of performing surgical revascularization versus percutaneous revascularization. And it's based uh, primarily, in the first generation at least, on angiographic uh, criteria. Uh, the precise score is, is, was derived to try to assess the risk between ischemic and bleeding, bleeding events, but there are many other features, as, as you were alluding to, that we would like to take into account when we consider risk. And, and if the perfect score would also include more information about the severity of the coronary disease and the distribution of coronary disease and the success of the percutaneous procedure. So uh, there are, there's room for development of more important score, also taking biomarkers into consideration and to a greater extent. So there's much more work to do. I, I think in addition we have to acknowledge that the syntax score was developed in the setting of um, stable angina. And the syntax uh, study did not include hot um, ACS, so, so there is some uncertainty to what extent it pertains also to ACS. Sorry, I was... No, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a question. Uh, Do you have a comment? It's okay. I, I, uh, let me uh, comment one issue, uh, one new issue that uh, probably has not been uh, put on the table in this uh, symposium. It is the characteristic of the stent in order to justify the use in this complex patient, high risk uh, patients, because of two facts. First of all, the thinner. Uh, the, the thinner strata of the stem have that promote less disturbance of the flow and less probability of ischemic events. So may promote uh, uh, that the shorter duration on the anti therapy may be of uh, more value, I mean. And the second uh, one is the uh, level of the neoendotelization that this strain promotes. And Chema have a, a trial on that, uh, showing that uh, uh, nearly 90% uh, of the start has been endotelialysis at the first month of duration. So this my uh, additional argument in order to justify the short duration of the antiplatelle therapy with these stents. I agree. I think it's fascinating. I've, I've thought about that many times. What is the reason for, what is the explanation for these stents to perform so well? Yeah. What is the reason for the very low risk of stent thrombosis and great yeah. performance? And it's hard to differentiate the stent design versus the polymer versus the mm -hmm. drug, but, but the combination seems to be very, very effective. And the, I, I think the strut thickness, when you come down to such low thicknesses and still can, still can uh, have the radial strength. Uh, you're really possible to get deliverability, but also radial strength, and reduce turbulence, yeah. and reduce risk of, of stent thrombosis, and, and low risk of restenosis in the long term. True. So it's fascinating to see the development. Yeah. Any other questions or, or comments from the audience? Otherwise, we'll spend a f just a few minutes on concluding this session and and then finish on time. So please, my co-chairman, good friend, Franz Joseph, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, I think we had a very interesting session, and um, at least I've learned quite a lot. These are my conflicts of interest. It, this is just uh, to, to remind you that um, the impact of a severe bleeding uh, is, is, a, is about, uh, has about the same importance as the impact of myocardial infarction, and this is um, taken from the, from the work of the Isaac group, and here you can see that uh, if you have a myocardial infarction, the subsequent mortality uh, is increased, uh, but if you have bleeding, and in this analysis it was uh, uh, any bleeding, but it was mostly driven by the more severe bleeding, you can see that the impact on subsequent mortality was, was about the same. So really, we, we need to take um, into consideration the risk of bleeding and not, not only the ischemic risk. And I think uh, by now, uh, the cardiology, the interventional cardiology uh, community has, has learned this. This is uh, also taken into account in, in the new uh, ADAPT guidelines, and you have uh, seen this slide in uh, previous talks. And in, in, the, in, in the previous talk by, by Jose, uh, 
And you can see that uh, in this guideline, we always stratify according to bleeding risk and uh, the um, timing for, for, for um, a dub duration is uh, very much dependent on individualized treatment decisions. And uh, you can see that if you have a high bleeding risk, then uh, there is a need uh, to shorten a dub duration. And this is already acknowledged in the current guidelines. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, the ischemic risk is, is very high, it may make sense uh, to continue for longer than even one year. But if you take a close look, uh, particularly in uh, looking at the short durations, uh, you can see that it's still a C. So it's, it's belief and there is lack of data. And uh, therefore, is it, it, it's really important that we have a lot of uh, very um, interesting studies with the Schoenese stent on short dub duration. And I think there is uh, mounting evidence for an individualized uh, dub duration. Uh, in, in this symposium, you have seen uh, the data of the senior trial, which is uh, really a landmark trial in this uh, setting. Uh, you have seen uh, the design of uh, the POEM trial, which will look at one month's uh, dubbed and um, have a historic uh, comparator. Um, there will also be an uh, ideal left main study, um, which will compare um, dubbed with, uh, for, for four months with Synergy uh, to dubbed for 12 months with Xynes. And there's also a very big trial uh, looking at twin month dubs in high-risk uh, patients, which is the Evolve Shop dub trial, which we weren't able to show at this symposium. Uh, just uh, to remind you uh, that uh, this study has just completed uh, enrollment. It included more than 2,000 patients at 110 global sites. And um, it was uh, included patients who were considered by the treating physicians to be at high bleeding risk. Age is a criteria, <coughs> history of major bleeding, and uh, then the patients were stopped at three months, and I'm very curious about the results um, of this trial. Now, I, I need to uh, thank uh, Boston Scientific for sponsoring uh, this uh, meeting, and uh, I, I think that uh, Boston Scientific has a real uh, track history of a number of studies, a number of landmark studies, uh, which included uh, industry-sponsored studies, but also support for investigator-initiated uh, studies. And this uh, includes more than uh, 33,000 patients. And um, uh, the, the work is, um, is going on. And uh, there are also a number of abstracts, which I like to point out, that you may look at. And some late-breaking trials, maybe we will uh, see each other there. Thank you very much for attending the session and um, have a nice meeting.